I went through a period in my life that I was just being crushed. My heart was broken. I was worried. It was one of the most distraught moments in my life. And I was literally crying when I told God this. I said, Lord, I hate this. I absolutely hate this. But I love you. And I know you would not allow me to go through this if it were not for my good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. I feel more like a groupie than a guest. I've, <laughs> I've admired you over the major parts of my life and read so many of your books, and so I'm anxious to have this opportunity. I might pull out my pom-poms. Oh, you, we, we've been working on pulling this off for a couple of years, that's haven't true. we? That's true. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we got right. derailed a time or two, but, but here we are. Thank you for and this it opportunity. Is, it is truly an honor for me. It Thank truly you, is. I know that there are several million people who would love to have this chair right now. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to do my best to, to, represent, to represent them. And, and, uh, and we're just going to have a great conversation. We're going to have fun. We sure are. We sure are. I, I just wish I could be at your dinner table. I hear you're a great cook. I can throw down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it often because I'm not a healthy cook. Well, you know? that's okay with I'm me. I'm a holiday cook. A holiday cook. What, <laughs> yeah. would, what would we be eating if we were sitting at your oh, table? Oh, banana puddings. I do banana puddings from scratch. I do soul food, old-fashioned grandma-style cooking. I, a lot of desserts, yeah. pineapple upside down cakes, red velvet cakes, all that Look kind of stuff. Look at you. Yeah, I'm the getting kind, hungry. Yeah, the kinds Somebody of stuff. Somebody send out for yeah. some food. Hurry, yeah, get it yeah, in here. Yeah, the bad stuff, all the bad stuff. <laughs> You don't use a cookbook. I do sometimes. Do sometimes. Well, not for my mother's recipes, which were her mother's recipes. And yeah. I have some, some, some grandma left in me. So from time to time I do. If it's something new or different, uh, then I'll go. But, but I don't follow the recipe long. I kind of add my own little spin to it. Do you ever cook just for yourself or do you... Do you like to cook for a lot of people? I like to cook for a lot of people. Is that right? I like to cook for a lot of hungry people. Hungry people. I, I like to cook for people who make noises when they eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so belching is permitted. Yeah, belching and groaning and moaning and telling me how good it is will make me cook all night long. Well, what if I need to loosen a belt? <laughs> oh, I too? love you. That's I just okay. love you then. That's yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, my goodness. <laughs> You know, we're going to talk in just a moment. We're going to head in the direction of this amazing book. I, I, I read it in one sitting. It's wow. not out yet, but I got an advanced reader copy, and I can't wait. And uh, I think I have more pages dog-eared <laughs> than not dog-eared. And um, so I, it's, the challenge is going to be limiting, uh, picking the parts I do want to talk about. But, but could we talk about you? Sure. How, how, what, what makes you you? Where you kind of where you came from, the influences in your life. I, I know, I know you, you, most people know, but for those who don't, you grew up in West Virginia. Charleston. Mm -hmm. Charleston, West Charleston, Virginia. West Virginia. Can you tell us a little bit about your home life growing uh, up? A hillbilly, a hillbilly, now turned cowboy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I grew up, uh, my sister, who is here in the audience tonight, and uh, I have one sister and one brother. I was the youngest one okay. uh, in my family, a family of five. My parents migrated here from this, uh, here. My parents migrated to West Virginia from uh, Mississippi. My father was from Mississippi. My mother was from Alabama. Okay. Uh, my mother was an educator, and my father was an entrepreneur who started a janitorial service. And uh, we grew up in the 60s in the turbulence, uh, very meager, very meager beginnings. Mm. We, In retrospect, I realized they were meager. At the time, I didn't know we were poor. <laughs> uh, they, they hid it from us yeah. uh, be, because we were so filled with so many other things more important like love and loyalty and a sense of connectivity and a, a family cohesiveness that at this age, my brother and my sister and I still live in the same city. Do you really? We're still together. Still connected. Yeah, we're still together. My mother, when she was dying, told us to stay together all the way to the end, wow. and we have done that. Wow. Yeah. Your father passed when my father you passed were young. Early. Yes. Right. Yeah. Can you can you tell about how that how that happened? What happened and how that impacted? I, I think that probably had more to shape my ministry. Had to do with shaping my ministry than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, he got sick when I was ten. Uh, he was a very big, robust sort of a man 
very hardworking, strong work ethic sort of an individual. Uh, my superhero yeah. of sorts. He got sick, uh, his blood pressure went up to 290 over 280. Wow. Shut down his kidneys, he had renal failure. Uh, they were in the early stages of dialysis. We were one of the first people in our area to uh, start dialyzing, initially driving back and forth to Cleveland, Ohio. So I grew up in trauma, mm. in crisis. And uh, my mother was driving my father back and forth to Cleveland Clinic twice a week. Twice a week. And then we got our own kidney machine. And to be honest with you, I could run a kidney machine and couldn't ride a bicycle. Well, my goodness. Because because this you were 10 years old yes. when he was sick? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so my whole focus was about taking care of him. And so he lived till I was 16 years old, and then he passed away. Mm. And and I think it, you know, as tragic as it was, and it was tragic for me, it was traumatic because he, he, he died in the confusion of my adolescence. Um, in, in, the, in the turmoil of who am I? It's hard enough to be a 16-year-old. Absolutely. If everything is wonderful. Yes. But, but to have that happening. Yeah. The, well, when, when you have that sickness in the home, it becomes the centerpiece mm. of the family. Mm. And everything else has to be built around mm. that. And, and you have to take a subordinate role because of the crisis. So being raised in crisis shaped my perception of what was important. Mm. And uh, in some way or another, I have always been taking care of hurting people all my life. Mm. And so it is my default setting to go into that zone, whether it is spiritual pain, physical pain, all of my life has been in some way a caretaker. So ending up a shepherd of a church kind of makes sense mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the absence of my father and the aching void and the deep abyss of, of my confusion and uh, alienation they created an, a thirst to find something to fill that chasm that he left. And I think that caused me to have a ravenous approach to God. Hmm. Um, How do you explain that it didn't cause you to have a ravenous desire for drugs or for anger or bitterness? I mean, or did... Or, did I passed by all did of you that. Pass? Okay. Yeah, on the way to Jesus. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. waved? Yeah, you, I passed by all of that on the way to Jesus. Uh, the, 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 the thing was, there was a, a call on my life when I passed by those things mm. that uh, was disruptive and disturbing and unrelenting. And uh, I knew that I was here for a reason. I saw glimpses of my future, even before he died as a kid, going to hear my mother speak, I, I would tell her, right now I'm going to hear you speak, and they call me Miss Jake's son. The time will come, you'll come to hear me speak, and they'll call you Tom Jake's mother. <laughs> but I didn't know I would be a preacher. I okay. just knew, I saw glimpses of myself. You could see that. And yes, in front of a crowd and, and, and talking to people. I've always been fascinated by people. And, and I started out in church on the piano, oh, playing for the choir. Really? And yeah, God tricked me. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was going to be a gospel artist. But a, as I grew in, in, into the music realm, I noticed that people got more blessed over my introduction than they did my song. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, maybe I need, need to scoot over a little bit this way, you know. And, uh, you, know, you know, destiny is something that we grope after. Mm. Uh, providence and purpose is something that, that we see through a very dark glass and some of the most momentous moments in my life, I stumbled into mm. groping to understand uh, why am I here mm. and, and who am I really? And I think that, that those questions to me are more important mm. than, than answers. Uh, whether I come to a text, I never come to a text with what I know. I, th I think that the smartest preacher is the one who comes to the text as a fool. Mm. Mm. Uh, and what comes out of that, that foolhardy uh, humility. humility is revelation knowledge. Yeah. If you come to the text too smart, yeah. you have a preconceived idea of what it says, mm. and you can't hear revelation mm. because you hear too much information. Mm. That's good. Yeah, That's good. yeah. You figured you got it all figured out. Absolutely. Yeah.
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And 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 I started carrying my Bible when I was in high school. Did you? The latter years of high school, and and they started calling me a boy preacher. Did they? And uh, I was carrying my Bible, trying to find. At moments, I was trying to find God, and to be honest, at moments, I was trying to find my father. Mm. And and suddenly, I realized that they were the same. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That 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 he was not this supreme being that didn't have the capacity to be intimate, that he could be my father, that I could climb up into his arms and that I could tell him my deepest, darkest secrets and that I could trust him. And, and so relationship with him nurtured me more than religion. Hmm. So there has always been some friction between religion and relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, though I grew up in, in the church, in a, in a little Baptist church, in, in West Virginia, and then later in a Pentecostal church in my, in my teens, uh, religion never could hide his face from me Good. to the degree that I didn't see relationship as far more fulfilling and satisfying. Yeah. Does it surprise you that you became a pastor? Looking oh, back? yes. <laughs> oh, yes. For reasons I won't say on TV. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you talked about least likely to be in this situation. I mean, you know, I was a terror as a little kid. Uh, so your, your hometown, if we, could, if we could somehow go back to the 10-year-old version of you, we would <laughs> see if, no. Scary, <laughs> scary, <laughs> but inquisitive. Yeah. Uh, everything, I believe that everything we ever become, we already were. Yeah in seed form, I get, I would and, and the acorns don't look like oak trees, but no, they're in there. They're there. The design and, is in the seed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so when I look back at my DNA and my propensity uh, to lead and my proclivity to talk mm -hmm. and, and my fascination uh, with life, mm -hmm. uh, my mother used to say that the world is a university and everyone in it is a teacher. When you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. be sure you go to school. <laughs> and I've been doing that all of my life. Mm. Yeah, I've learned from everybody I ever met, good or bad, right or wrong. Yeah. I learned something. You're curious, aren't you? Oh, extremely. You're curious. Extremely. Can you tell us about your mother? Oh, for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I get my fight from my mother. Mm. Uh, my mother. My mother was a warrior. My mother... Uh, graduated from high school when she was 15 years old, grew up in Marion, Alabama, uh, went to school with Coretta Scott King. Did she? Yes, yeah, sang in the choir when she knew the Scott family very well. Uh, got out of high school at 15 and did four years of college and three and came out with a double major and went to do her student teaching in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, Later on, when she was 50, went back and went after her master's in teaching children with learning disabilities. So my mother, my mother grew up quoting poetry and, and prose and poems to really? us and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And she didn't start teaching school until I was of age. And so uh, she went from teaching school to being eventually the Equal Employment Opportunities Representative for the state of West Virginia. Is that right? She, yeah, she was uh, smart. Uh, she was strong. She did not believe in you giving up and uh, breaking down and, mm. and letting go. And she took get yourself together. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And every time, even to this day, every time I feel myself about to give way to the stress and the pressures of my life, I can hear my mother's voice in my head saying, get yourself together. Sit up in there. Don't you, don't you let them throw you over there. You know, she was like a coach. And really? some of that is in my preaching. Some, sometimes yeah. I can hear her voice in my preaching, that relentless tenacity not to allow the vicissitudes of life to overwhelm your soul yeah. comes from more than, than faith in God. It comes from fervor in mm. the human spirit mm. that has been modeled in front of you by the people yeah. who went before you. There are so many people sitting in this chair right now, it's a wonder it doesn't fall to the floor. My mother, <laughs> my mother You've sitting got a whole here, legacy. my father yeah. sitting here, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my great-great-great-grandmother who was a slave named Nancy Jakes that I remember. 
Mm. She's sitting in this chair with me. Really? My great-great-grandfather, Willie Smiley, whose mother was a slave and died when he was 103 years old, wow. he's sitting here with me too. Yeah. I am the sum total of, mm. of hundreds of people yeah. who shaped my life, and they, they are gone physically, but they all left uh, indentations on my soul. Mm. Mm. A whole legacy. Absolutely. A whole and legacy. I think that's true of all of us. Well, it is. It yeah, is. all of us are, are, are the sum total of, of small deposits that are made by the people who pass by us along the way. Yeah. Was, was there a person, um, well, there's so many things I want to ask you. <laughs> um, some, a, a mentor or an influencer outside of your family, maybe a teacher, pastor, coach, uh, neighbor? I, my some, spiritual father is Bishop Sherman Watkins from Columbus, Ohio. He's still alive. He's 21 years older than me. And um, mm. he, he's, he's just had an indelible impression on my life. What, what, how did you connect with him and what, uh, what was the difference? He was, he, was, he was a young man and I was a kid. The first time I heard him preach, I was 16. Hmm. And uh, when, when I was 16, he must have been, uh, what, 37, something like that, 27. And I, I heard him uh, preach. And uh, little by little, he lived in Columbus. I lived in West Virginia. Over the years of my early pastorate, he was the one who sent me to my first church. He was the one who mm. laid hands on me and licensed me and ordained me. Uh, he, he was the one that would uh, chasten me and the funny thing about being a guy is that we get love from correction. Yeah. You know, if you if you love me enough to get in my face, then I respect That's that. Good. I yeah. respect that. It's and you a, appreciate oh, that. Oh, and, and he would get in my face, you know. <laughs> he would get in my face. And 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 that became uh terms of endearment. A lot of people don't understand that they only recognize mama love. And so they only define love by nurturing and mm -hmm. tender words. They don't understand that, that I come from an era when men raised boys to stand up and there was, a, there was something expected of you, mm. you know? And so I responded readily to him mm. and uh, he's, a, he's a great joy uh, in my life. The other day he was coming down off the stage and I was trying to help him off the stage, you know? And he looked at me and he said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> is he still preaching? He's still preaching. He oh is still God. preaching, you know, at 80, 81, 82, I mean, 83, yeah, 82 or 83 years old. He's still preaching the gospel every Sunday and teaching on Wednesday nights. And, and not only is he preaching, he's calling me up and telling me what he's going to I'm preach. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's a wonderful thing. You must bring a lot of joy to his life. We do to each other. Uh, I, when, when fathers and sons become older, the graduation of sonship is to become your father's friend. Mm -hmm. And there's no, no higher yeah. honor than to be yeah. your father's friend. Yeah. 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 I, I, I know we're going to get to the book. <laughs> um, but I'm still curious. You know, there are people who, um, who um, they grew up in, in, a, in, a, in a simple background, mm -hmm. uh, had their share of challenges, mm -hmm. not as many as you, uh, but they had their challenges. And yet they come out angry or mm -hmm. bitter, mm -hmm. uh, bitter toward God, bitter toward the world. They anesthetize their pain rather than deal with their pain. Mm -hmm. in, in your book, Crushing, you, you, you talk about how if we believe in a sovereign God, mm -hmm. we can see that these are ordained struggles that make us the people that we are. Right. What, where did you pick up on that? I mean, if, if you hadn't have known that, Bishop, you might have become bitter. I, you know, uh, some of it came from not being allowed to feel sorry for okay. yourself. Yeah. Uh, some of it came from uh, my mother's uh, relentless, tenacious commitment to, to you standing up. Mm. Some of it came through 
being bo I was born in between two dead babies. Oh my. The one before me and the one after me died, I was the one that lived. Okay. And, and so I learned early that life was precious and then my father died when I was 16. Yeah. And that, that there's nothing like lowering your father in the ground yeah. to make you breathe life more deeply as if you might not have tomorrow. Right. Because now you're aware you could possibly not have tomorrow. My greatest birthday was my 49th birthday because he died when he was 48. And when I became 49, I broke the curse. Mm, mm. So, so that was a great thing for me to, 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 to do that. This, this whole notion and this, this fidelity that I have uh, with, with the scriptures and particularly with the whole crushing thing came while I was sitting out on the terrace. Uh, I, I I got this word from the Lord that comes to me in the strangest kind of way uh, that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. And there sitting out on the terrace, I saw in my spirit the bruised heel of Jesus. And, from, and, then, and then the next flash, I saw the, the, the stained feet of women stomping grapes in the wine press. And, and the bruised heel of Jesus and the stomping of the feet on the crushing of the grapes brought me to the Passover cup. Hmm. And he said, this is the New Testament That's in right. my blood. Right. And suddenly I recognized his affinity to the grape, hmm. that the grape itself would tell us hmm. that the only way to extract the most valuable part of the grape was for it to be crushed. Mm. And the only way to get the essence of Christ was for him to be crushed. Yeah. And out of that crushing comes the revelation that, that crushing is not a yeah. destination. You don't get stuck in it. It's mm. transportation. Mm. Mm. It's transportation. Mm. I, don't, I don't know any body who ever became major in any area of life, not just church, any area of life, who, who was not propelled by the force of some level of crushing. Yeah. Something, yeah. something that could have killed you and should have killed you became the catalyst and the urgency through which you evolved into your, the highest expression of who you were meant to be. Mm. Can I read you what you said? Sure. <laughs> it's going to sound better when you read it. <laughs> Listen to this. It's, it's from the book Crushing. It releases this spring. Uh, crushing places reveal that there is more to our lives than we had planned. The truly invaluable, marvelous, and eternal aspects of our identity and ultimate destiny are displayed in us there. It is in the midst of painful crushing that we realize that the blessing found in the production of fruit in our lives was never the master's end goal. Our latest crop of fruit was merely part of an ongoing greater process. Yes, sir. What you're helping us do, at least what you help me do, I think all, um, all of us, is you're helping me... Uh, interpret the tough times of my life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're telling me that there is a, a plan, mm -hmm. that there is a purpose, and that I'll get through them. Absolutely. I'll be better on the other side of them. Am, am I? Am I you're, yes, sir. You're, right you're, you're hitting it exactly right. And I am telling you that the greatest part of you is still somewhere down inside of you and only pressure will get it out. Only pressure. Yeah, yeah. that you have not seen who you are in the pleasant moments when you smell the blossoms on the vine and feel the sun drench on your face, that you were raised not to be fruitful, but to be crushed. Ooh. The grapes, when, when I wish the, I could highlight that <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the old silver tongue itself. Uh, it, 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 the grape is one of the few fruits that is raised to be crushed. Look at that. Yeah. You know, with yeah. crushing in mind. Yeah. Christ was born to die. Anything short of that would have been failure. Mm. That's why when Peter tried to stop the crucifixion, yeah. he called him a devil he and did. said, get behind me. And he called Judas friend because he understood that he was raised like the grape to be crushed. Mm. And so he did not, he, the, the Bible says that Jesus set his face mm -hmm. to go to Jerusalem. 
but he did not rest his head until it was on the cross. Mm. Mm. And understanding that for this purpose came I into the world. Mm -hmm. And not that you love suffering, he despised the shame. He despised the shame. Mm. But for the joy Joy that was set before him. So he looked beyond the crushing and he saw the wine. Mm. You see, and, and, and understanding that wine is taking that, that grape into its most powerful expression mm. and it is putting it in its most eternal form mm. and, and life crushes us from time to time because nothing else will get out of you the hidden treasure that we have locked up in earth and mm. vessels mm. but to be crushed. Amen, amen. Are we ever beyond crushing? Do you ever live long enough where you can say, oh good, I've got all the crushing behind me. It's just, it's just harvest from now on. You, you, you know, you, you know the, the funny thing about it, I think periodically wherever there is purpose and wherever there is resistance to that purpose, pressure releases us from that resistance. And the more that we yield to the process, but, but the problem today is that we don't preach process. We, we preach promises. Yeah. Yeah. So we have raised a generation of people who, who see God in promises, mm. not process. Mm. So you go to church on Sunday and you hear about the promises of God. You go home to the process. And when you encounter the process, you say, well, God is not in this. Right. And I would argue that God is more in the process than he is in the promise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is everybody taking notes? <laughs> you can say amen. <laughs> He's in the process more Absolutely. than the promises. In Absolutely. Fact, the promises only make sense right. because of the process. When you pass through the waters, I'll, I'll be, be with, with you. you. Yeah. When you go through the fire, I'll be there. Yeah. His promise is to be with you in the process. Mm. And, and, and there are things that you cannot learn about him until you are in the process. Mm. There is a revelation of his glory that only comes in the frustration and the disruption of your life. He said, I'm a present help in trouble. If you avoid the trouble, you'll avoid me. Mm. Mm. The the literal language, Jehovah Shammah, I am present in trouble. Mm. I am revealed in trouble. Mm. Mm. I I show myself strong. When men forsake me, Mm. then the Lord will take me up. See, so, so, so it was good for me that I had been afflicted. Had I not been afflicted, I would have never known the glory of God. So all through the Bible, the Bible keeps, Mm. the very symbol of our faith is a crushing place, a cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. Mm. It's not a crown. No. You know, it's It's not a crown. It's not a throne. Mm. It's a cross. cross. Who makes an invitation from a cross (laughs) but Jesus? Yeah, yeah. You know, you make an invitation. You say, come go to Hawaii, you know. <laughs> you know, let's go to Switzerland. Jesus says, come on, let's go to the cross. Mm. That's a hard, that's a hard invitation. Take up your cross and follow me. Come on, let's yeah. die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who, who wants to go do that, okay? If the only way you can follow that kind of request is to know that what is on the other side is greater than anything that was before it. Mm. And, 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 and understanding that is what this book is all about. And, and let me just interject one thing quickly because we've talked about graphic overt crushings, but I want to warn the audience about invisible crushings that come from forces that you cannot see, like stress and heartbreak and pain. Nobody has to be sick or lock you up or you don't have to come out of prison for you to be crushed by stress. Uh, Science teaches us that the same part of our body that reacts to physical pain, the same signal goes to your brain from emotional pain. It sends out the same stimuli throughout the neurological system Mm. when your heart is broken Mm. as if it would if your leg was broken. Really? So you don't necessarily have to incur physical injury Mm. to be crushed by emotional stress. Mm. 
And we are living in a time of, of unseen forces bearing down on our soul on a daily basis. Everything is going so fast. Technology, social media, we've got everybody saying everything about everything all of the time. And the whirlwind that we're in right now is the wine press. Mm. The whirlwind, the, the spinning, the mad spinning of our lives causes the, the, the centrifugal force of being spun around causes pressure all by itself. And, and in that fast pace that we live in, there is a certain amount of invisible pressure. And the strange thing about it is you feel the pain, you sense the pressure, and you can't see the source. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're getting the impact as if there were an assailant. Hmm. but there's no assailant that you can see. You can't lash out. And, and God says you can, you can either see it as the wine press or you can see it as the potter's wheel. Hmm. But the more it spins, the more he touches it and the more it changes in the spinning. And if you are not prepared for disruption, then you're not prepared for resurrection. Hmm. Yeah. Not prepared for disruption. Yeah. You're not prepared for resurrection. Yeah. What I hear you saying to us is, is don't try to escape your troubles. No. But lean into them. Lean into it. Lean into them. Lean into it. And and say, God, what are you telling me? What are you teaching me? Consider it all joy, my brethren. Yes, sir. When you face various trials and tribulations. Yes. Yeah. And, And I'll be honest. That's not, the, the somebody said, that's not easy to do. No. Uh, it, it's not something that you do from the place of your emotions. It's something that you do from the place of your teaching. I went through a period in my life that I was just being crushed. My heart was broken. I was worried. It was one of the most distraught moments in my life. And I was literally crying when I told God this. I said, Lord, I hate this. I absolutely hate this. But I love you. And I know you would not allow me to go through this if it were not for my good. And though tears are running down my face and I cannot see my way out, if, if you suffered me to be bruised, it is only to make me better. Mm. And so I trust you when I mm. can't trace you. Yeah. Yeah. Because he that hath began a good work in me will bring it to completion. Shall bring it to completion. You yeah. cannot you convince me. It. Yeah. yeah. You cannot convince me that he's not for me. Mm. Mm. And if whatever he ordered for me to face, it, when it's all over, it has got to end for me. Mm. Because I am, con- the, the, the relationship that I am the most secure of mm. is him. And the reason I am so secure is there's nothing about me that he has not considered. Mm. From start to finish. From start to finish. There's not, all things are naked before him with mm-hmm. whom we have to do. Yeah. You know, my, I could disappoint my wife or disappoint my children or disappoint my mother. They could find out something about me and change their mind about me. God could never find out anything about me. Not cannot be surprised. Yeah, he cannot be surprised. <laughs> there, there's nothing yeah. about me that he doesn't already know. He's already made up his mm-hmm. mind about me. He has rendered his verdict. He has rendered his verdict. Yeah. And there is therefore now. Yeah. No condemnation. No condemnation. Yeah. So yeah. whatever he ordered for me to go through in process. Right. right. Well, you, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and mm. you should fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, thou, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I anointed my head mm. with oil. My cup, my cup runneth over. You can't have the run over if you don't go through the valley of the shadow yeah, of death. Yeah. And, and, and listen at hope screaming in his ears <laughs> in the darkest moments of his life. Surely, not surely. maybe, not surely. hopefully, but surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow, shall follow me. me all the days of my life. And when it's all over, I'm going to dwell in the house yes. of the Lord, Lord forever. forever. I love that. That's good. <laughs> I love That's that. good. That's good. Yeah. So when, when we stand, you and I, over short caskets and small graves and children burned in fires, it isn't 
always possible to explain no, sir. suffering. Yeah. Uh, it isn't always possible to, to make people uh, rejoice in that type of agony. Hmm. Uh, I teach people just survive it. Hmm. That's what we have to do. Just survive it. Don't try to understand it. Right, right. Just survive it. Because if if you survive it, on the other side of it, you're going to see something Hmm. that makes it, in retrospect, make more sense than it does today. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Looking back at the rearview mirror, uh, it's not that it was ever a wonderful thing to go through, but had my father not died when he did, I wouldn't be who I am. His death was, was the birth of my ministry. Mm, mm. You see, and, and this, the seeds always hint to us that life comes out of death. Mm. As the outer encasement corrodes in the ground, mm. the inner life bursts forth. Yeah. And everything that dies in you is only so that something else can be born in you. Yeah, yeah. It occurred to me once that that the reason that God can, uh, that he allows us, he permits this, these seasons of suffering mm-hmm. to come. You refer to this in your book as well. And that is just the intense brevity of this life. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's going to last forever. Right. When, when I turned uh, uh, 60, mm-hmm. which is kind of a long time ago now, as I stop <laughs> and think about it, um, my three daughters and two son-in-laws uh, came over for a party. And, and what I wanted from them for my birthday was 20 minutes of undivided attention. Mm-hmm. And so they had to listen. Mm-hmm. They, I gave them no option. And I took this rope, Bishop, this thick rope that you use to tie up boats. You know, those mm-hmm. big, thick. Yes. I went down to a store and bought it. And I, and I took the rope and I tied it to a piece of furniture. And then I opened the patio door and I threw it over the balcony as if the rope was disappearing. Mm. And I gave each of them a um, black marker. Mm -hmm. And I said, pretend that this is my eternal existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Locato's eternal existence. You can't see it. It goes on for infinity. Mm -hmm. And I gave each one of them a marker. And I said, now, could could you indicate my earthly life on this rope? And they're used to me doing these odd things. You know? <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and then they realized, and one of them said, Dad, we can't make the dot tiny enough. It cannot be tiny enough. Wow. And we talked at, in that little devotional about how the Apostle Paul talks about these brief and yeah. momentary struggles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't seem like it when we're in the middle. No, they don't at but all. But our Heavenly Father looking on us says, you know, Locato, you can go through two or three years of hardship mm-hmm. because of the good, because of the good it's going to give the kingdom and your character. Mm-hmm. But then also, it's not that long. No. It's not that long. No, it is, it is not that long. And you cannot allow it to be that long. That's right. You know, one of the things I've tried to convey in the book, some people refuse to get well. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> they, 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 they refuse recovery. They yeah. refuse. That was and, the question of Jesus to the, at the pool of Bethesda, right? Right. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Yeah. Some people refuse recovery because they have built a system around dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. And dysfunction becomes comfortable. I got my cup, I got my coat, and, right. and I'm prepared to be blind. I got my three square meals yeah, a day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to sit by the side of the road and shake my cup and wear my coat. Yeah. And then Jesus comes and disrupts it all. Yeah. And, and, and the cup has to fall and the coat has to drop that blind Bartimaeus may be healed. Mm. And, and it is the urgency of, of a fleeting moment. Mm. The escape out of pain is a fleeting moment. It is passing by. And if you're not willing to come out of your coat and drop your cup mm. and, and step into that moment blindly yeah. without understanding it, without somebody apologizing, without somebody coming back and making it right, this is not about them. This is about you. Mm. Mm. This is about you. Mm. This is about the moment of your liberation that when you get, I never will forget when uh, in the middle of my mother's funeral, uh, one of my dear friends came down and I said, I want you to be prepared to preach it. She always wanted me to, but I don't think I can. I said, but if something happens in the service 
and a breath of grace blows by my face. Mm. I'll step into it and do it. Mm. And, and in the middle of my pain, this, this window of grace opened up that gave me the strength. And I stood up and walked up there and preached my mother's funeral. In, 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 in a, <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like a little boy who had done a good job on his Easter speech. You know, I did. I was uh, now there, you know, you know because, be, because the, the grace to escape is a fleeting moment. And you have to take that grace rather than to refuse to recover only because you languish in the attention of the mourners who come by your side mm. to help you uh, stay incapacitated. Mm. There, you, you, blind Bartimaeus knew that if Jesus kept walking by, he would have died blind. That mm. was his last walk past that, that road. Yeah. And if he didn't get it right then, he wasn't going to get it. And whether it comes through a song yeah. or a friend yeah. or a message, when, 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 when he calls you, harden not your heart, yeah. you, you have to receive that right then and say, yeah. I'm coming out. Yeah. And not feel guilty that you came out and not feel ashamed that you came out and not stay in for the benefit of people who have built their lives around your pain. Mm. Mm. Because there are people who make a job of you, of you being afflicted. Mm. That's where they get their identity. That's where they get their identity, and they need to be needed, so they mm. need you to stay broken. Mm. Yeah. And so you have to have the courage to get back up again. Mm. You, you have the courage to rise up in the cup. Mm. The thing about wine is that it swells. Say that again. The thing about wine is that it swells. And that's why you can't put new wine in old skins huh. because it swells, <laughs> you see, <laughs> you know. And, and so when, when that moment to escape comes, you can't be encapsulated by something that is inflexible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the people we build around us are old skins yeah. who won't give us breathing room to swell to, to yeah. our capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they, they love you as long as you stay on a certain level. Right. As long as you fit in their box. Right. That, yeah. that's, that's what I'm talking about. About crushing causes you to expand. I'm bigger through everything I went through. Yeah. I'm stronger through everything I went yeah. through. I'm tougher yeah. through everything I went through. The, everything I suffered in West Virginia prepared me for everything I would go through in Dallas. Wow. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So uh, what was painful in West Virginia, yeah. I became grateful for in Dallas mm. because I thought, oh, I, that's mm. nothing. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, I saw that. That's elementary school stuff right there. You know, and, and so God lets Moses practice yeah. his miracles in private before he brings him before Pharaoh. Mm. Mm. And so God sets us up in situations that are non-threatening so that we can practice so that in the mm. day of confrontation, we, we have some experience mm. at handling this moment. Yeah. Joseph. Yeah. Joseph. What's man, better he, than he that? Was, he, was, he, was, he was tested in his affliction. Yes, sir. Right? He was tested in his affliction. Absolutely. And don't you know that the reason that Joseph could be strong is because he could look at his brothers and say, what you intended, you intended this for evil, mm -hmm. but God. But God. But God yeah. intended it for good. Yes. And what I see in, in your life that I admire so much is that you have kept that but God in the mm -hmm. middle of your story. Absolutely. A lot of people want to get it out. You intended evil for me. Yeah, and it yeah. stops right there. Right, right. That's where their story stops. I think, I think, you know, I, I, <laughs> I knew we were going to do this. I think that's why God chose him mm. of all the brothers. I think that's why God blessed him because Joseph had the capacity yeah. to bless somebody who had hurt him. Yeah. See, see, when you start talking about wine, you have to talk about capacity because growth is there. And Joseph exemplified the capacity to be bigger than his situation. Yeah. And, and so to him whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. And, and I really believe with all of my heart, when you read through the story of Joseph, his, his greatest strength was his ability to love those 
who had victimized him. Because when he saw him, he wept. That's Remember right. Remember before he disclosed, for they recognized Th who he was? That's right. He had to step out and weep. His heart was so tender. That's right. He and I, I actually think that when he said, you meant it for evil, but God made it good, I think he was trying to comfort them, mm. not chasten them. I think them. you're right. Yeah, I think, I think, think he, right. he, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You meant it for evil, but I'm okay. Yeah. God yeah. made it good. Yeah. I still got there. Yeah. You know, the, 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 when you take your story away from the people who hurt you mm. and determine in your heart, whatever you did, it's okay. I still got there. Yeah. there you won't have any reason to be bitter. There you go. In, in fact, yeah. <laughs> it, it's not just that I got there in spite of you. In many ways, I got there because, because of, of you. you. Because of you. Yeah, because You didn't you. know it, but you were helping me. You were helping me. You were teaching me. You, you, were, you were helping me. me. You were teaching me. You were training yeah. me. Uh, you were preparing me, and I have this, this capacity mm. because you stretched me. Mm. He, God gives us a, a, an ability to reinterpret our past, right. doesn't he? Yeah. Rather than see our past as, uh, as, as rather than see ourselves as victims, Mm-hmm. Of, of a difficult past, he, he gives us the grace to look back and say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. our sovereign Lord was at work even in that. Even in that. Even in that. If God spared not his own son. Yeah, but gave him up for us all. But gave him up for us all. Who, who am I to think that, that I am above going yeah. through yeah. anything, you know? Why not J me? Job says, <laughs> the Lord knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth mm. as, as pure gold. I may be in the fire right now. But <laughs> shall come forth. Yeah, but I shall come <laughs> forth as pure gold. And I think that if you can keep the promise of the wine with you while mm. you are being crushed under the feet, mm. that this is not my final form, mm. That, that the, though I stain the feet of those who oppress me now, this is not my final form. There is something coming out of me mm. that's greater than what is hurting me. Mm. And what is coming out of me, you will never be able to stop. If you can keep that in your mind, mm -hmm. uh, you will understand why, why Christ came to the Garden of Gethsemane to prepare him for, for the cross, to remind himself that crushing is all that he was going through, that the secretions of what was in him was better than the pressures that oppressed him. Wow. And, and I'm hoping to write this book to somebody who has something in them that, that they could not get out any other way. And I want them to understand that, that pressure turns to power mm. when God does the pressing. That's right. Pressure turns to power. <laughs> We, we assume that presence of pain is the absence of God. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is a presence of pain can be the best work Absolutely. of God. Absolutely. Best work of God. And if you, uh, m my wisdom is made out of my mistakes. Mm. You, mm. you only become as smart as you were a fool. <laughs> I'm pretty smart then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you, 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 you think about how you try to tell your children, you're suddenly trying to tell them what not to do because I don't want you to take the class over. <laughs> you know, I already took the class for you. That doesn't work. Don't try that. Go this way. Go that way. Yeah. And, and yet sometimes they have to have their own experiences to have their own relationship with God. Uh, but, but I think that I think that the word is, is being written in the experience of our lives even yeah. today, yeah. That, that in some ways we are the 67th book, that we are living epistles yeah. read of men and that God is writing through the situations on our lives because mm. we are the only Bible some people see. Yeah. So sometimes my testimony isn't so much about what I say, but you watching me survive. Yeah. Yeah. what nobody else would have been able to right. survive. Right. Yeah. Thereby, by this I know that the Lord is with me, mm. for he has not allowed my enemies to triumph over mm. me. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Can I read from one of my favorite authors? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if your life is suddenly unstable, 
and you notice an increase in the amount of mess and manure placed upon you, that's great. <laughs> Pay close attention. It is a signal from the Lord for you to look carefully for the areas where your growth may have stalled. Mm -hmm. The vine dresser applies an extra amount of dung to a plant that stubbornly refuses to grow because the messes of life serve as the vitamins required for healthy fruit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you, 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 you use kind language there. <laughs> <laughs> but that describes where some of, well, it's, some of the listeners are. Growth is smelly business. Growth is smelly. Yeah, growth is smelly business. <laughs> it stinks. Yeah, yeah, growth, growth is smelly business. Uh, birth is messy business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to think that babies were born and they looked like the Gerber babies and the old movies that when we were growing up, you know, the baby, they just pulled the baby out and it looked like the Gerber baby. Yeah. But in real life, birth is a messy business and birth is a smelly business and birth is a painful business and birth is about pressure hmm. and pushing hmm. and the baby is bruised and the mother is weak and yeah. weary because life is valuable it costs something, mm. and you can't have life without labor. Mm. You see, and that's what makes it, it, it to me, what makes it valuable uh, is, is the baby now, in, in the old days, they would salt the baby to heal it from the birthing mm. process mm. so that there is a certain amount of, of healing. One of the things I talk about, I'll just mention this real quickly, I know our, our time is almost over, is the pain of recovery. There is a pain on this side of surgery that's different from the pain on that side of surgery. Just because a surgery was uh, co correct and effective doesn't mean that the patient doesn't feel pain, mm. that, that it hurts to recover, that there is a pain of recovery. And just because you feel pain doesn't mean you're not getting better. That's true. In fact, that yeah. pain is an indication you are getting Absolutely. Yeah. That's what Any, I'm saying to you. In, anybody who's tried to get in shape, yeah. right, knows that there's no fun. Up. Let's not even talk about that. Oh, my God. <laughs> but yeah. it hurts. Yeah, it, it hurts. It, 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 because, it hurts because it hurts because you are tearing muscle. Mm. And, and, and the, as the muscle tear, tears, it expands. Yeah. And any time you're going to swell, it, it hurts to grow in yeah. capacity. And so people who become these voluminous people, it costs them something. It costs a lot. And it, it, be careful about envying them and wanting to be them. And I, I'm going to be you and I'm going to be the next you and I'm going to have your mantle. You can't have my mantle until you've withstood my misery. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I don't want that misery. No. <laughs> We, we uh, are out of time. I know. Oh, my goodness. I knew this would happen. I knew it. We're just warming up. Yeah, I know. We're just getting started. We're just warming up. Um, a word do you have for somebody who is, is, is right there in that mess? <clears throat> I, I, I want to say to you that if, if you are in that crushing, I have been there physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, in every aspect of my life. I, I want you to understand something that whether the Lord scooped down into the ground and pulled up clay or set it on a wheel and started spinning it or pushed in on it with pressure and started squeezing it or set it on a curio after he had fired it, that regardless of whatever stage it was in, it was always in his hand. And I want you to know that whatever stage you're in right now, you are still in his hands. Amen. Amen. He loves you. Amen. He cares about you. And when it is all over, he will take what was seemingly a crushing moment to to produce something in you that is so distinguished, so fresh, so new, mm. that Christ said, I will not drink any more wine until I drink it new in my Father's with name. you 
in the kingdom of God. So I got to be there. Because <laughs> he told me, he said, I'm saving the next glass for us together. That's good. It's going to be all right. It's going to be good. <laughs> she said. What is your word? On, on behalf of the uh, tens, hundreds of millions of us who have learned from you all these many, many years, God bless you. God bless, God bless you. your family. Thank God you. God bless your fruit. Thank and your you. best days are ahead. Thank you very Amen. much. Amen. Thank you. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.